So these are the three questions I, I invite the listeners of your intended message to, to, to ask the group in the end of the meeting. Welcome to your intended message, the perfect place for leaders and promising professionals who want to convey the intended message for greater success. Every week, we interview experts who address the challenges and best practices to deliver your message effectively. That might be one-to-one, one-to-few, or one-to-many. And perhaps the most important conversation, one-to-self. I'm your host, George Torok. My guest today is Katerina Kastula. Katerina, here's three facts I think you should know about her. One, she worked as a global business leader at Google in London, England for eight years. Two, her book, Hold Successful Meetings, was published by Penguin and it became an instant bestseller in its category in France, Germany, and Netherlands and a number one new release in the UK and the US. And the third fact, her first job ever was to be an extra in the Martin Scorsese produced movie, Brides. Uh, Katerina, welcome to your intended message. Thank you, George, for having me here. I'm so excited. Delighted to be talking with you, especially about a topic that I'm sure is probably causing a lot of pain right now. And that's the topic of meetings. I imagine that meetings were painful even before virtual meetings, and now even more so. In your experience on what you've seen, why do you think we mess up with meetings? What, what mistakes do we tend to make over and over again? Why don't we get it? <laughs> oh, yes. I think the, the biggest mistake is having a meeting with no clear purpose or having a meeting for the wrong purpose. A lot of times we think we need a meeting to update each other. And that's not true. It is a typical meeting that could have been an email. Or we have meetings that boring status meetings that everybody hates and the deeper objective we have is oh we need to be connected as a team but actually to be connected as the team you you would be better off have social time have some do something else a joint experience rather than have a, a boring status update so i would say that's the number one mistake um there, there are many more I, I can keep going. <laughs> no, no clear, no, no clear purpose, and, and having it for the wrong reasons. Now, I remember uh, with with some companies I worked for, we would have a Monday morning meeting. Why? Because it was Monday morning, <laughs> and, I know. And, and that's probably the wrong way. And and there and there might have been a real, and, and I believe there was a purpose to the meeting, but calling it the Monday morning meeting probably set up the wrong expectation. Instead of calling it the uh, um, the weekly planning, production planning, or, or something. Even now, there's my question uh, that just came to me. Would it help clarify the purpose if we gave better names or titles to our meetings? Yes, and that's a that's a great idea, actually. I, I in my book I talked about how to better set the agenda. And make it interesting like we as humans would like answering questions so a question rather than calling it a budget meeting or the budget item you could have how can we improve our profitability by 10 percent that's an exciting you want to go there because your brain wants to solve to answer that question so i in the book i include a lot of tips about agendas uh, but your idea about the title of the meeting per se i love it i think that's great Mm. And, and I also like the idea of setting up a question. The, the, this isn't a budget meeting. This is a meeting. That how, how, can we, how can we improve profitability by 10%? How can we, how can we streamline the uh, costly um, delivery costs or something like that? Now, now people can. And now the interesting point is that when 
now people can come to the meeting. They've already started thinking about what the purpose is, as opposed to showing up. Okay, another meeting. What do we do now? Absolutely. Absolutely. Why? Well, let me, let me back up there. If, if you could give one piece of advice to a manager who's, who's got a meeting plan for tomorrow morning, it's, you know, the meeting's tomorrow. There's not yeah, much yeah. you can change. But if there's one, one point, one aspect of the meeting that they could make overnight to be ready to, for tomorrow morning's meeting that would make it a little bit more productive or less painful, what would that advice be? I will continue with the same theme about purpose. I, I introduced the 4D model in the book and it's four outcomes you can pursue in the meeting. And it all everyone starts with a D to make it easier to remember. You can either define a problem or a goal. You can develop ideas. You can decide or do something in the meeting or have action as the outcome after the meeting. So define a problem or a goal, develop ideas, decide or do. These are the stages to solve any problem, by the way. So the first thing I would say to that manager is what, which one of the four Ds, maybe there's more than one, are you going to pursue in your meeting tomorrow? These are the outcomes. And if it's more than one, let's say we want to define the problem and develop ideas, do it in distinct sections because then you align all the participants to, towards the same outcome. The chaos in meetings happens. And I've seen this because I've observed tons of meetings of my clients, because someone is producing ideas, someone is trying to work, work through the implementation of one of the ideas. The other person doesn't understand the problem at all. Like the leader usually wants to make a decision and move on, but people are still generating new ideas. And there is chaos because individually, we move through all these stages of problem solving back and forth, but if you put a, a, a team or a group trying to, to work through a problem, everyone is in a different stage and there is chaos. So a simple, very simple thing you can do is actually be clear with your participant. Is this a develop ideas meeting? So the outcome is we'll leave here with a list of ideas. Is it a decide meeting? Are we gonna leave with a, a list of decisions? So that I would say will have a, the biggest impact in short time in the outcome of the meeting. So it sounds like simplifying and clarifying the purpose and maybe, and, and, and tell me if I got this right, one key purpose for meeting is it might be a, a smarter way to go at it? Especially now that you have the luxury of virtual meetings, you can have shorter, yes. For example, it's a good idea to, to separate a develop ideas meeting and a decide meeting. So you can actually separate divergent thinking and conversion mm -hmm. thinking, because we know we've seen through MRI scans that you cannot do both at the same time. You cannot be in a creative mode when you need to make a decision because you're judging and this impacts the creativity, right? So if it's an important topic, I wouldn't say like for a small topic, have two separate meetings. If it's an important, if it's the strategy, I would have a separate meeting to develop the ideas and then maybe have another meeting to make a decision or, or maybe a different group needs to make the decision. You don't need to have the same group developing the ideas. You can have a wider group developing the ideas, but then have a smaller group of people making the decision. I see another problem there. Who, who need, how does one decide who needs to be at the meeting? Do we just invite everybody because we don't offend anybody? Or, or do we invite everybody because we don't want to, you know, we want to cover our butt, you know, like, well, I invited everybody. No. So there is a lot of research about this. The moment you surpass around seven attendees, your decision-making capacity reduces for every um, person above seven, it reduces by 20% or something. Like, I think that's what the data says. So it's a lot harder to make decisions when you have too many attendees, you, you don't go into depth. People will maybe not have an equal chance to contribute. They may be more self-aware and self-conscious because it's a bigger group. Like as humans, we feel more exposed in a bigger group. So we won't be truthful enough or share the mistakes or the crazy ideas. So there is, a, we, we need to have, we, the questions I invite our, our listeners to think, George, about this topic is who decides who, need, who is the decision maker on this issue? Who will execute? And who will consult on this? Th these three questions, who needs to consult, who needs to make the decision, who needs to execute? And 
and then be really um, strict, like explain to people, you don't have to harm the relationships because it's true. Like people want to participate in meetings because they feel excluded. Like it's the tribal, I need to belong in the tribe, right? So you, you need to be careful about this. But if you are to have productive meetings, you need to have the people you need and not more. What about agendas and minutes? Is that still relevant? Should, should we still do that? Or is that just a waste of time? So there are benefits on having an agenda that people know what we're going to discuss, that they can prepare, that pe some people can join only on that topic. Again, saving more time. And they, <laughs> if they know that we have this topic, they don't have to attend the whole meeting. But the tips, again, for the agenda, we, we, we make too many mistakes, right? One mistake we make with agendas is we don't order by importance. So we, you waste time because you have in the beginning. Like, it's proven that we spend disproportionate amount of time in the meeting in the first item on the agenda. So you need to be very strategic what item you will be put in the beginning. That's one mistake. Then boring agenda items that we already covered is a, is a different uh, mistake we make. If it's an important meeting, I will have an agenda and I will ask people to contribute to the agenda. Like I, I if it's a team, when I do team coaching sessions, which is an important meeting, it's a half a day or a full day, I would interview people or even send a survey before what do we need to spend the time on? Because spending time together is expensive. So the preparation is important. In terms of minutes, so what we, what I always used to do is rather than minutes is finish the meeting in a way that you get alignment. What did we decide? What are the next steps? Who, like who does what by when? What was the value that was created in the meeting? So these are the three questions I, I invite the listeners of your intended message to, to, to ask the group in the end of the meeting. And, and this is what you write down and you communicate to your stakeholders. And now, you know, there's, there's apps. Like, I think the technology has moved ahead. There's even apps that can transcribe a meeting. And you, if a transcription is important, or if you're recording the meeting, then have a transcription with the, the, the time so that people don't have to watch the whole meeting and they just watch when the, this decision was made. There's different technology can help, but the whole meetings, like really writing it with the hand, I don't think, I think that's previous century now. Let's look at timing. Uh, some meetings are held every week, every month, every quarter, beca because that's the way we do it. And there might be a good reason for the meeting to, to review things at that point. And then there's other meetings that are just when we need it, when a problem comes up or a, a new opportunity and we have a quick meeting. Uh, are, are there two different approaches to those, those meetings? Is the regular meeting just an update and the other meeting, uh, we've, we've got an opportunity or we've got a crisis. Uh, and so two different mindsets in those meetings? So... I recommend never to have a meeting for just an update unless the update is emotional, like whether it's good news or bad news. As you wouldn't, <laughs> George, you wouldn't send a text to, 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 to uh, leave a, a girlfriend or a boyfriend. I, I suggest if it's bad news or even good news, do it in person, do it in all hands so that people can celebrate or they can process the emotions together. If the update though, it's not an update that you expect will have an emotional reaction, there are better ways. Like I remember when I used to work at Google, our president will do video selfies and, and send it. So I would watch it with his update whenever I finish work, rather than interrupt what I'm doing, go to a meeting to listen to an update. Like, as you can see, like in the past, we used to watch TV at a certain time and now you watch it when you can, right? This, the, meet, the business communication needs to move towards this model as well, if it's about updates. What I would say about your question, George, is, that it tends to be that the ad hoc meetings, usually they're not as much of a waste of time as the regular meetings because there is a need. We need to discuss something, something whether it's to make a decision. So what do you do knowing that the, the standing meetings, the regular meetings can be a waste of time? And there, there are different ways depending on the company and the culture. There are, other, there are some companies that will have uh, it's a hold in the calendar, but someone needs to say, 
yes, we're going ahead and this is what we're going to discuss. In, unless someone put a stunt on the sand that we're, the meeting is going ahead, they are not going ahead. Some people make them optional. I, and again, that's hard for the people's psychology. An optional meeting, yes, but some people will join even if it's a waste of time just to be seen or from FOMO, not to miss out. So I would say, yeah, I think having it as a hold in the calendar and having someone to actually say, yes, this meeting is going ahead and this is the outcome we, we want to achieve will help reduce the wastage of time. It's still, both meetings are 40 meetings. Like they need to uh, pursue a 40 outcome, I would say. Now, still on the topic of time, what's, what's the right length of a meeting? And how does, how does one decide how long the meeting should be? Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to give a very good answer on this, George. The answer is it, it depends, <laughs> as you might have expected. Um, because you have, for example, you have Richard Branson from Virgin saying he is having 10-minute meetings for one single topic, and he doesn't think that any meeting should be longer if it's one single topic. Or Marisa Myers, that when she used to be at Yahoo, she had five-minute meetings. So you have that at, at end of the spectrum. But then you do have, when I work with teams, we do have four-hour sessions, right? Because we, it's, it's a team coaching session. We, we want to have time to have the difficult conversations that the team has been avoiding. So for a team coaching, or when you're discussing something strategy or in a team coaching that you're discussing the challenges the team is facing, it will be counterproductive to have a shorter session because what I, I wouldn't want to do is open the difficult conversations and not allow time for people to express themselves, reflect, share, feel heard. Um, so depending on what you're, you want to achieve, sometimes you'll need more time and sometimes you'll need less. Mm. Now, I suppose there's two ways that a, that a person, an attendee might leave the meeting. They might leave thinking, gee, I wish we had more time. Or two, they might leave and say, that really dragged on way too long. <laughs> and I suppose what we'd hope for is that they'd leave wishing they had more time. Uh, so how, how do you find that? How do you walk that balance of, of you, you know, it's, it's like when you, uh, uh, you, you have a wonderful meal, you, you, you want to eat enough so that you feel good, but you don't want to overeat so that you just have to lay down and nap after. <laughs> and, and you don't want the same thing to happen in meetings. So how does one find, now you mentioned a four hour meeting. It's that, now that sounds like a, uh, coaching training workshop more than a than a typical you know like exchange meeting so that was a working sure. workshop type of and I can understand that yeah it takes time to uh, to uh, to understand the concepts and build the skills so how does someone decide that you know what our 60 minute meetings are too long from now on they're going to be 40 minutes I think that example is great because sometimes we are prisoners of this conventions, of our calendar conventions that by default, you set up a meeting and it's 60 minutes. So I think, A, as you said, George, we need to be very deliberate of let's try it shorter. Second, even if, and that's the, the Parkinson's law, slow, right? The, the, the work will expand to the time you allocate to it. You, we need to work against that. Like if we finish, uh, our discussion earlier, we should be able to give people back their time. So I would say, let's try to have, I would experiment, have shorter meetings. And most probably you'll see you, you achieve uh, what you wanted to achieve. Um, better preparation will, will help, like really knowing what we're discussing, what's the outcome. Um, but you know what, I, I, I don't want people to leave thinking, oh, I want more. If you, I want them to feel a sense of completion. And the way you do that is by actually five to 10 minutes before the meeting ends saying, okay, we reached where we reached. And again, doing a proper wrap up rather than what we see in most meetings that time runs out. We wasted so much time, but we didn't dedicate um, the time where we needed to be. And we ha don't have anything to show for, for this expensive time because if you have eight people together, that's expensive, right? I wanted to share something with you, George, that is a bit counterintuitive in terms of saving time. And that's how you start the meeting. 
And there's quite a lot of research, like a lot of people will say, oh, we want to be productive, let's get down to work, right? And we do that, but that's a mistake because there's a lot of research that you, that if you spend time in the beginning to connect on a personal level, you will be a lot more productive when it comes down to work. Like they've done experiments, even negotiation, like they told people negotiating, get down to the negotiation. And they told another group, the control group, find something you have in common first and then negotiate. And the value of the deal, the people that connected first was a lot higher than the value of the deal, the people that never connected. So that's counterintuitive, right? Because we think let's get down to business, but actually spending time in the beginning, center ourselves, what are we trying to achieve? Connect on a personal level, tell people, people subconscious that, you know what? you're here and you should care because this is what we're going to work on and you're here and you belong here you're a valued member of this group this is important to establish in the beginning so that you have a productive meeting now that's i find that curious and i don't recall ever hearing a meeting leader doing that for a meeting i've been in but you know but just that phrase that you're here because you're we need you here and you're valuable and, and, and we need you to help us solve this, this problem or, or implement this change, but actually recognizing people for the value that they can contribute. Now that, I like the sound of that. I can see that right off the bat, getting people feeling like they're, they've got something invested in the outcome of this meeting. Yes. I, I like that suggestion. Now here's now that leads me to a question: Who, who's most, who's responsible for the success of the meeting? If the meeting was a failure, do we blame the meeting leader, the facil meeting facilitator, or do we say, well, it's all their fault? They obviously messed it up. I think everyone should share responsibility. But in order to do that, again, I think in the beginning, if it's an important meeting, you should do some we, co coaches, we call it contracting, right? Okay, how are we going to make sure this meeting is a success? Or how can we, are we going to show up in this meeting? So if, you, if it's a team that meets often, I think that's a valuable discussion to have. And you can have some in the contracting, you could have some rules, we will be honest, we will respect each other, we will have fun, whatever that is. You can do some contracting in the beginning to make sure that we, every team member, takes responsibility for everyone feeling included and psychologically safe. That said, again, research says that, especially on inclusion, the leader has a disproportionate responsibility on whether people feel included and psychologically safe. So yes, everyone should uh, have a shared responsibility, but if you are the leader, it's, it's it's an extra responsibility to encourage people and welcome dissenting views, uh, make sure people that are usually interrupted or ignored, which is usually minorities, are welcomed in and you bring them in. Uh, because how you are as a leader will have an impact on the feeling of inclusion and belonging. Now, what can a leader do for those team members who are in the meeting, but are reluctant to contribute for for different reasons. Maybe they, they just don't feel confident enough. Maybe they think they're being judged if they say something wrong. What can the leaders do to include those people and make it feel safer for them? Um, a few things. First, again, when I suggest connect on a personal level in the beginning, the leader sharing mistakes, for example, it's a great example, like Pixar, who's a very successful company. When they hire new employees in their onboarding, the leaders go and share the mistakes the company did, made. And that's because they wanna sh share the message. We're very successful, but everyone makes mistakes and you're encouraged to challenge your superior. So in the meeting as a leader sharing mistakes, how you respond to the people that do contribute is important because a lot of times when we disagree, we want to move on, we shut down dissenting views. So welcoming, even if you don't agree, the, the contributions, because the, the, the more reserved people are observing, right? And they're seeing the leader, how are you reacting to the person that did speak? Oh, you welcome that. I'm more encouraged to speak, right? Create a structure. Like if we have these boring meetings with presentations, if I'm a little bit reserved, how, when am I going to speak? Like, will I interrupt the presentation? Maybe you can have, let's do a round robin and everyone shares an opinion. 
And now with virtual meetings, what I will give you uh, the listeners, um, two more tips. One is use the chat box because it's a lot easier for introverted people. Like say, let, let me, let, let's all write in the chat box what we think about this or from one to 10, how, to, how to much do we like this idea? And also using uh, breakout rooms because again, introverted people feel a lot more comfortable in smaller groups. And now with virtual meetings, this has become a lot easier. So that could be a way to get people discuss it in, your, in couples first and then come back and maybe each, each one of you shares the other people's view. Like that, that's something that works very well for introverts. They don't have to share their idea. They'll share their couple's idea, for example, and things like that, Fasi simple facilitation techniques. But again, modeling, welcoming, inviting uh, is uh, really effective. And, and I can appreciate that as an introvert myself, when, when, I, when I participate even now in meetings and, and certainly through my work career, I, unless I was leading the meeting, I was not likely to speak up or certainly wouldn't have been the first person to speak up. It would be, you know, and, and I'd wanted to make sure that they actually wanted to hear from me unless I really felt strongly about something. I, I'm not going to speak up. I mean, you know, and you're right. I was spent most of my time observing what's going on. What are the dynamics in the room? And there's always people in the room who are observing and I suppose we need to uh, uh, give them the opportunity. Well, what did you observe? What did you see? And, yeah. and somehow there needs to be that free space in there. Uh, I've, I've heard some uh, executives and, and managers say, well, when I hold a team meeting, I, I want to get some creative ideas from people and everybody shuts up. Like no one's, no one's, no one offers anything. What am I doing wrong? What can I do to, to encourage them to offer creative ideas? I love this question. And the first thing that uh, our listeners of uh, your intended message can do is ask people to write down their ideas individually first. The, that's huge because when you write, you, are, you pose the question and a good way to pose the question is the design thinking, how might we achieve X, right? And then ask people write individually because then they don't have the social anxiety. They are themselves writing the ideas. They don't block, they don't block each other because they have to listen at the same time, produce ideas. Like, so you have more quantity of ideas. You have more crazy ideas because you're not afraid of people uh, judging you because it's you and yourself writing. But then, you also need to share the ideas because maybe you something that someone says sparks off a new idea. So I would say the first tip is write your ideas individually first. If, if you want to spark the creativity, you can uh, actually use different reframes. So what I do usually with the teams I'm uh, leading the meeting, I will say, how would we solve this if we were Apple? How would we solve this if we were Cirque du Soleil? How would we solve, the, solve this if we were the army and we needed like precision, military precision, and that sparks different ideas. So doing some kind of guided ideation that you offer people uh, stimuli when they're writing their ideas. And then we share and let be inspired by, by each other's. Do you want one more tip about if that yeah. doesn't work? Yeah, um, yeah, I, I'm intrigued. Yes, uh, and I like the the idea. How would we solve this if we were Apple? How would we solve this if we were the the military? You know, you know, how would we solve this if we were ninjas? <laughs> yes, why not? Um, the other thing I I recommend if there's a team that there's um, some social anxiety, they don't feel very comfortable with each other, is frame the problem in a negative way. For example, if it's a brainstorming, how can we please our customer? Frame the brainstorming, how can we really annoy our customer? And have them brainstorm on that because there will be laughter. There's no pressure to come up with good ideas. All the ideas are bad. And this could unlock some extra creativity because if you come with many ideas to avoid, to annoy your customer, you, you if you return them on their head, there'll be some good ideas to, to serve the customer there. I like that idea because it appeals to, I imagine it appeals to the, the silliness, the, um, the humor in people. Let's have a little fun. And you just gave us permission to annoy the customer. So yeah, I can think of great ideas to annoy the customer. And along the way, 
we're we're being creative and now we just need to flip those creative ideas and probably have something useful there so that's a that's a fabulous way um i like that thought and you know i don't recall ever being in a meeting where someone has done that it, it's always it's always a well we got to solve this problem hurry up you know we got to get the problem solved come on get your thinking caps on come on what's the matter with you people can't you come up with something <laughs> yes you're so right george and now meetings can be an energy drain how can we how can we flip that to make meetings if is it possible to make meetings be an energy uh, an energy inspire an energy creator can we can we walk into the meeting like this and then come out whoa that was a great meeting <laughs> is can we do that uh What's your experience? Has this happened ever to you as an as an introvert? Um, you know, I don't recall that ever happening. Although if I search, you know what, there are some meetings where I have left the meeting, and I felt better after because of the quality of the discussion, because the, the discussion stimulated me. Yes. And, 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 you know, I had a chance to participate and listen to stimulating conversations. And yes, so in that case, I suppose now that I think about it, in those cases, I've left the meeting feeling better. Yes. So what I would say, research says the more meetings we have during the day, the more tired we are in the, by the end of it. So meetings are tiring. So we need to have blocks for deep work. We need to have... Ha half an hour between meetings. It's even more tiring when it's back to back because you don't have time to contest to switch. So there's a lot of tips I have in the book as well. How can you actually waste less time in meetings and only have the useful meetings? But I went deeper, George, and I said, what are the deep human needs we have, right? And we need A, to feel powerful, that we can make a difference in this world and B, that we belong. And if the meeting is successful, you really satisfy your deepest human needs because you are more powerful when you're working with a team. Like that's what set the human race apart. Like if you go individually with the tiger, tiger is more powerful than you. We, we really had progress because we learned how to work in teams. That's what gives us power. And the sense of belonging, if you have a great meeting and you feel I'm working with a team, we're solving a problem that matters, and I feel that belong in this team, you, you will leave more energized because you will have satisfied, satisfied your deepest human needs. Uh, Katerina, on your website, there is a quiz that people can complete to just test the quality of their meetings. And, and, and it's it's a free quiz that they can take and they'll get uh, almost immediate feedback, giving them some ideas. The place to find that, I believe, is the website, theleaderpath.com forward slash quiz. Exactly. Yes. And, and when they're there, they can complete the quiz. And one of the benefits of not only will they get an analysis of how they complete the quiz, they also get access to the first four lessons of your course hold successful meetings yes they do for free and at the same time if they want they can also learn more about your book hold successful meetings because um i mean who i don't know anyone who can't improve the quality and the benefit of their meetings it's an ongoing uh katarina in in wrapping up if there was one two or three pieces of advice and maybe it's something you've already said, but just final advice to leave to a meeting leader so they can start making their meetings more productive. What would be the top three priorities for them to, to, yes. to go after, to do? I would say the three, three priorities is be clear on the purpose of the meeting and remember the 4D meeting framework to make that easier. Be clear whether you're there to define a problem or a goal, develop ideas, decide, or do something. The second piece of advice I would be pay real attention to the psychological safety and inclusion of the group because you want people to bring their best self. So work really hard on making people feeling uh, included and psychologically safe. And the third is pay attention to how you start the meeting 
and how you finish the meeting because it will make a huge difference to, to the experience and the productivity of the meeting. Powerful advice. And I wonder how many, all of them, uh, clear purpose, uh, make it inclusive and safe and pay more attention to how you start and end. I find those all powerful advice and maybe something that more of us need to do. My guest today is Katarina Costula, reminding you that at the end of your meeting, imagine what it would be like if people left your meetings feeling more powerful and that they belong. If you like what you heard, remember to like, comment, and share this podcast. Come back every week for more practical insights to help you deliver your intended message. I'm your host, George Torok.